All right, good morning, lovers of the word. This is Dr. Tom, and uh, me and the boys are moving into the new place here. So I want to thank you for the prayers. You know, incredibly different, um, a lot better, and I appreciate it all. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah. This is an exciting part of chapter 3. Um, I know a lot of people hate the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of reformation, the, shall we say, Calvinistic type doctrines, or what I call biblical doctrines. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, we see not only the call to repentance, but we see the beauty of election, power of God through his saving grace. And it's only through the electing power of the true and the living God. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 3. Father, I pray and ask that you bless us reading your word. Grant us wisdom and knowledge. And Lord, I just want to thank you for giving us your word. Your kindness is unbelievable, and your mercy is beyond compare. And Lord, we just love you and thank you for giving us such a wonderful word and for being our God in Christ's name. Amen. All right, this gets really exciting. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn on over there, and uh, we're going to begin our reading at verse 12. So let's go ahead. Go and proclaim. He's speaking to Jeremiah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north. What is the north? It is the northern ten tribes. That's why it's called backsliding Israel. You see, the northern ten tribes were already under the Assyrians. The Assyrians had conquered them. They had settled troops there. And we're going to see that it's causing a great deal of stress. I mean, nobody wants to be enslaved. Nobody wants to be conquered by another nation. And nobody wants their life abruptly changed. But that's exactly what has happened here. The Assyrians have moved in. They've conquered northern Israel. And northern Israel is learning the hard way about the wrath of God. But God does not like, he does not like having to dish out his punishment or dole it out. And so what does he do? He says, Jeremiah, I want you to go to the northern ten tribes. And I want you to cry to them. And so he's going to have to take the circuit the Lord Jesus did all the way up and down. It's about a, a 13 miles to 18 miles and then all the way back down. So it's quite a big circuit. And it's a circuit that the judges used and it's a circuit that Jesus used later on. So he's going to have to travel and proclaim this message. And so what does he say? Return, thou backsliding Israel. Saith the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Friends, isn't that beautiful? And we talked about backsliding, and that's when the farmer owns a, a cow or an animal, usually it was a bull, and he wants to sell it off, and um, the bull doesn't want to go. And so they would take and pull the rope up through the front of the cart, one or two people or more. they put their feet up there and be pulling with all they have. They ain't going out and pull a bull. So what they did is they would have another person with a sharp stick, and they would just bury that stick into the back end of that bull. And every time he jumps forward, they pull it and wrap that so he couldn't get farther down. So in other words, the will of the owner was going to happen. And by the bull resisting, he suffered the pain. God's will will always happen, regardless of our desires. Friends, it is not God's purpose to make sure we are comfortable and that our lives are all sweet and, and nicely tucked. God's will is this, is that we worship and serve Him and that we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, friend, and God. And you see, that's why God is so wonderful. He says, I will not cause, if you, if you return, I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. In other words, God will reverse his wrath. Yes, they will still be in bondage for 70 years because they didn't let the land rest. But what will God do? He'll make those 70 years nice. In other words, he'll work with the Assyrians by changing their mood, their mind, etc., etc., and in doing such, they will treat them in a better way. God can give you peace during captivity. Look what he says. 
I will not keep my anger forever. Why? Because he's merciful. But here's the condition. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to strangers under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding Israel. So what's going on here? Friends, repentance is turning 180 degrees away from your sin to God. But it's not just turning away. This word acknowledges means recognize why it's wrong. Recognize why it's wrong. And then admit that you've been taking part in it. Agree with me. That's what repentance means. Agree with God. And if you agree with God, then what happens? You agree with God and you thank him for his mercy and his grace and ask him to forgive you. You see, that's what's missing is they do not have a desire to acknowledge their sin. Today we have people all around us that claim to be Christians, but they drink up sin like it's a like it's lemonade or in the days of Kool-Aid. I remember when Country Time Lemonade first came out in the Crystals. I was going all the way back to, I think, like 70, 1974. And my mama would make us a pitcher on a hot day. We'd get it every now and then because we were kind of really dirt poor. But when she'd get that, she'd make it last. And on a special day, she saved it for special days, she'd make that Country Time Lemonade. Friends, it was delicious. It was refreshing. And it was just what we needed. God is an incredible person. He's a God. It isn't his goal to make our lives comfortable. But guess what? When you're going through this world, and you are, and you have the true Lord God, you don't fear about the world. Oh, the world will try to make you fear. But you just turn your life back to him and trust in him. And he will bring whatever's going on to pass. So you acknowledge it, you agree with God, and you con confessing your sin, you ask for forgiveness. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, capital, so this means God the Father. Why? It's God the Father. He says, I am married unto you. You see, Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. But Israel is God's chosen nation, the Father, and he's married to Israel. So here's where we see election. He says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, I am married unto you all, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Friends, when he says, I will take you, this is election. What he's saying is, if you repent, and turn back to me, I will remove my anger. But since you're not going to repent, and I am married to you, see, he's not going to divorce them. He's not going to send them away. We went over this in the last one. And he's he's not going to sell them into slavery. And he's, he's not going to have them put to death, which is what an adulteress should have happened to her, along with the other one. But what's he going to do? He says, I will choose one of you out of an entire city, and I'll bring you to Zion. Zion means the holy city of God. He's saying, out of all a whole city, I'll choose one person, and I will open their eyes and bring them to me in worship. I will have one person. He says, I will have two of a family. Families were usually pretty good size. I mean, you would have cousins, aunts, uncles. So it's, it's talking about a large group. It's talking about the brothers, the sisters, aunts, uncles, and their children and cousins. He says, I'll just take two out of a family. So what's that mean? It means the sword is going to come in, the word of God, and it's going to separate the family members. Have you ever seen how it's not uncommon for one person to get saved in a family and then another one gets saved? And through the diligent prayers and the mercy of God, the rest of the family will begin coming to salvation one after another. So what's he going to do? He's going to bring, he's going to choose some and put his grace upon them and give them salvation. And he's going to use them to try to reach the rest because that's what the church is. 
The church are those chosen and given to the Lord Jesus Christ by God the Father. So look what happens. These that he chooses, he says in verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart. And what does it mean? According to my heart, it means his heart will be joined and placed into them. When the Holy Spirit enters in, he circumcises your heart. And God the Father joins you to him through his Holy Spirit and gives you his thoughts, his desires, his actions. These pastors will be led by God himself and they will be for the chosen ones that he's going to give to his son. This word for pastor is where we get the word for pastor in the New Testament, where it's pastors who are the teachers in Ephesians 5, poimeon de diasco. Well, the word for shepherd, as you notice, this ain't shepherd, it's pastor. And so here's where we get the doctrine of the church beginning. You see, that's what's different. Rather than going to the synagogue, you'll have a pastor who's going to watch over you, teach you, lead you, guide you, and he will be the under-shepherd under the Lord Jesus Christ. It shall come to pass when you will be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, this is verse 16, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of God, and all the nations shall be gathered into it, unto the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance to your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children? and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage, and a host of nations. I said, Thou shalt call me Father, and not turn away from me. Friend, what he's talking about is the final in-gathering. He is going. The church is right in there, and then through the church, he says, I am going to begin calling salvation to my children. That's the Jews. Right now, there are massive movements of salvation happening throughout Israel. Israel is becoming once more a land flowing with milk and honey. Friends, I like to look at the pictures, but they have the greatest growth of vegetables, gardens, fruit, fish pools. Israel is returning back to her glory days. A river has opened up in the desert, and it's a mighty river, just like he prophesied would happen. So what will happen? The church... Israel's rebellion, then he creates the church, he gives them pastors, and he calls to salvation just a select few. They become the burning lights and the bright lights that go out and preach. And people will either be converted, and that will be to the glory of God, or they will be condemned, and that will be to the glory of God. You cannot make someone want salvation. So this is the beauty of repentance and, and the glory of God in election. If he did not elect to save even the one out of the city or the two out of the family, none would be saved. Do you understand supralapsarianism, also called Dorsian Calvinism, or uh, what they call double predestination? Now, I believe in this because it's biblical. You see it right here. Do you understand all mankind is already going to hell? So God chooses to save some. If he didn't, they would all, we would all perish. You know, it's like a man, he walks along the beach and he throws starfish back, but he doesn't get them all. It's impossible. God, all things are possible, but he chooses to save some. Why? Because by saving some, it shows the glory goes to God. But also it shows that there is a separating point between the holy and the unholy. And only God can make clean that which is unholy. My friend, I'm telling you that it's the true power of the Lord God that is at work here in our lives. I'm trying to get my mouth to work. So, double predestination is when God elects some and chooses to give them salvation and predestinates them to heaven to be conformed in his image. By the very logic of it, and by passing over the others, they have been predestined to hell. Because without God's intervention, that's where they go. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and get into the next passage. Well, maybe I'll hold off on that. So we're going to talk about the effects of a disobedient wife. Um, when it says crying upon the high hills, and this is what happens. Adulterers, adulteresses, they live a two-faced life. They hide their sins from one, and they hide the other sins from the other. But they're miserable people. They're not happy. So what are we going to take away from this? We're going to take away from this. You can never get too far from God. If he's elected you to salvation, you are going to the holy city. You can't take yourself out of Christ's hand. He won't take his out of the Father's. But know this, you must repent of your sins. God will not be angry forever. He will be merciful and he will give you pastors, teachers, to lead you and guide you in the faith. And you will be in that holy city where the throne of Christ sits and rules and reigns from. All right, Dr. Tom, I hope you appreciate these studies in Jeremiah. They're pretty, I should say, sobering. Um, there's not, not, not a lot of cheerful reminiscion here, but we see the truth and it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where God takes and brings the sobriety out. All right, Lord bless you all. In Christ's love, this is Dr. Tom.